Spoštovani gospod minister, spoštovani gostje, dobrodošli ob turističnem omizju Blejskega strateškega foruma, kjer se bomo pogovarjali o negotovosti kot edini stalnici. Prosimo za razumevanje, da bo dogodek v celoti potekal v angliščini zaradi velikega števila mednarodnih gostov. Najlepša hvala. That was a brief introduction, dear minister and distinguished guests. In the Slovenian language, the language we are so proud of, for which we have fought a very long time to preserve it and still uh, fight, but we are, of course, extremely um, happy to conduct this uh, roundtable. Uh, in English, Slovenians are famous for being one of the best English speakers outside the Commonwealth and the United States, uh, of course, uh, too, so there will be uh, no problem. Uh, we have to qualify for the lunch buffet starting at 12.20, uh, 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 so uh, we would like to encourage a good discussion also with, with the audience uh, in the uh, latest part of the uh, uh, panel, but uh, let me start with uh, the introduction of your host, Ms. Uh, Maja Pak, the uh, director of the Slovenian Tourist Board, STO. Maya. So, dear Minister Matthias Hahn, dear colleagues, distinguished guests and speakers, I believe we are all delighted to be here at Iconic Blit for the eighth tourism panel organized by the Ministry of Development and Technology and Slovenian Tourist Board. One cannot be immune to the enchanting ambience of this place, often stated as one of the most beautiful places in the world. We have much to be happy about. Travel is back in a big way. With tourists regaining confidence in traveling again, industry numbers are in many destinations across Europe predicted to outpace even pre-pandemic levels. Travelers have embraced COVID as a new, manageable normal. They do, however, remain wary of what comes next, but they also understand the importance of seizing the moment. But if anything in this life is certain, if history, and especially the last two and a half years, have taught us anything, it's that one cannot get too satisfied. After pandemic disruptions, we have found ourselves in a perfect storm of far-reaching factors, such as Ukraine invasion, rising energy prices and food costs, supply chain uh, challenges, labor shortages, and last but not least, the looming threat of recession. We seem to be living not only in times of uncertainty, the mantra we have been repeating in the last couple of years, but in the age of permanent crisis. Instability as the only constant is correctly the title of this year's panel. Let me structure my messages around three, the tourism industry most pressing matters. Firstly, we must accept how bad things are. I'm talking about climate emergency. We have, ac we have accepted the fact that climate change is already affecting Europe in various forms, leading to higher temperatures, water shortages, forest fires, biodiversity loss, negative impact on people's health. But this year, there have been four times as many wildfires across the EU as, at, uh, as the historical average. Researchers say that the current drought that Europe is experiencing could be the worst in 500 years. An intense drought is shrinking rivers across Europe, revealing stones carved centuries ago to give future generations a warning of hard times ahead. One of the so-called hunger stones on the banks of the Elbe River has revealed the warning, if you see me, then cry. What a profound message. And this is only the beginning. It's not too late to take action and change our course. The window is, however, closing. The bad news is that, the, that climate action at the scale and speed necessary to protect not only the planet, but also humanity, is still not yet being displayed. 
Global media is this summer trying to get the message across that collapse is going to happen, but the good news is that they believe that this is the year people will start to notice. Secondly, it's not only the planet that is in distress, also the tourism industry is in dire straits. The previously mentioned perfect storm of multiple and complex health, political and economic factors have put enormous pressure onto the industry. This summer, we have all be, been witness to extensive and desperate staff so shortages in all segments of the industry, restaurants, hotels, aviation, transportation, visitor attractions. Thousands of workers left the hospitality industry when international travel shut down during the pandemic. Many chose not to return, finding better paid employment and better working conditions. The opening times have been shortened, hotel rooms remain closed, the range of services cut, flights canceled. Major European hotel chains are hiring workers without, without experience or even without a CV, hired in just 24 hours. Executives admit that years of underpaying staff have now come back as a boomerang. Increasing prices of raw resources represent a huge challenge to the added value of the industry, a prerequisite for everything, investments into new products, infrastructure, and people. But things are even much worse. With skyrocketing costs, the whole industry business operations are under threat. Global business travel spending is coming back at a slower pace than predicted. Furthermore, the pandemic has not only slowed down traveling, it has changed the way people travel. And on top of that, it also radically changed people. The way we live our lives, our passion, our preferences. And the list could go on. All this is threatening the industry, big time. Whereas previous crises have mostly led to drop in traveling and overnights and were followed by rather quick and smooth rebounding, the present situation is far more complex, deep and with lasting consequences. Therefore, thirdly, there is a strong need for new business models and more resilient industry, but also for coordinated EU response. As countries have taken measures to mitigate the impact of the pandemic crisis on tourism in the last two years, we need now to step up the sector's preparation for the economic and structural recovery. No question, we can only do it through enhancing in environmental and social sustainability. But next to this, we will also have to make some changes in our business models. We can't be doing the same thing over and over and expect different results. So we will have to reimagine our role, purpose. We have to be bolder and more dedicated in developing innovative, unique solutions in product development, experience creation, and, and tourist engagement. We have to facilitate and enable initiatives that boldly go, go where few have been before. Understand the value of people and be ready to fight for talent, to find new and innovative ways to attract people into the industry and keep them. We will have to embrace the era of hybridity, where there is so much more than only black and white. We will have to use new technology to innovate and launch new products and to change the narrative from selling beautiful places using shiny tourism brochures language to communicating in a more socially responsible way to educate travelers to travel responsibly. We will simply have to find the right balance between the profit, planet, and people. So to conclude, we need a joint, coordinated, response, but also the power of collective to move beyond the traditional growth-oriented mindset to a more inclusive, resilient, fair, sustainable, responsible, and climate-neutral tourism ecosystem. So there are, these are all the topics and questions that we will tackle in the panel discussion with our distinguished guests. I'm looking forward to the debate and conclusions and even more so the action. Thank you very much for your attention and have a very nice day.
Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Park. And now I'm happy to announce the Minister of Economic Development and Technology of the Republic of uh, Slovenia, Mr. Matthias Han. Najprej spoštovani na začetku vendarle, turizem je tudi jezik, zato si bom dovolil, da vas vseeno pozdravim v mojem maternem jeziku slovenščini in vam rečem in jim zrekam dobrodošljico na bledu in hvala lepa, ker ste prišli. Distinguished guest, panelists and participants, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to today's tourism panel. Thank you all of joining us today to discuss the future of international tourism. We are facing mounting economic, health, and geopolitical changes. We act in a very demanding and unstable period. In today's discussion, the main strength will be laid on the impact of the current events in the travel industry and the guidelines for it, its recovery. Some highly competent experts with share the ideas and recommendations with us. Our main question is, how should we address the many global changes and how will we cooperate in the future? This is very important. We are all aware of the high importance of tourism for national, European and global economy. This is where we really have to find the answer. In Slovenia tourism, my dear, is very important economic branch representing 10% of GDP. The last two years, we are very difficult for the tourism industry and all the tourism stakeholders. Tourism was one of the most COVID-affected branches, not only in Slovenia, but globally. National governments and the European Commission helped this sector a lot by adapting urgent measures, guidelines, as well as the resilience and recovery instruments. The results achieved in the first half of the year 2022 are positive. And we are optimistic about this year's tourism statistic, but, but you know what I mean but. The world is facing some other serious geopolitical and economic challenges today, such as military conflict, energetics crisis, climate change, raising cost of living, and so on and so on. One, and unfortunately, they have a negative impact of tourism as well. Because of this, Slovenian tourism adopt a new strategic document for the period of seven years. Our vision is our region is green and boutique destination with a small, this is important, carbon photoprint and great value for everyone. With this Slovenian tourism, we'll get a chance to develop in a more sustainable way. My dear, I'm certain that we all agree that peace is a fundamental base for tourism development. We know that tourism is a bridge for build, building understanding. Peace is common understanding, the essential for 
recovery. All the conflict, all the conflict should be set it by diplomatic means. This could be one of the message, messages of today's tourism panel. Diplomatic means and peace. Dear participants, I wish you a pleasant stay in Slovenia, many interesting experiences and meetings with friendly Slovenian people. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Han. Now, an obvious question for all foreign visitors of today's panel um, is, do all important people in Slovenia have surnames with three characters? I mean, Han, Pak, and we're here in Blit, and the most, most famous athlete uh, who comes from Blit is a multiple Olympic and uh, world rowing champion, Istok Chop, I mean, C-O-P. Um, and, of course, we have a mayor here whose surname is Pfeiffer, and you can also write it with three characters, five A-R. <laughs> but but you, you will see uh, Slovenia is a small country with a great variety also of surnames, and you will um, hear that also uh, in the panel. But, but before that, uh, we're really happy to announce uh, two presentations of um, very famous international guests. And the first is Ms. Zorica Orosevic, the Executive Director of the United Nations World Tourism Organization, uh, who will have a presentation on the state of tourism in the world in these troubled times. So, Ms. Orosevic, you're really invited to take the floor. Dobro jutro. Ja neću moći da pričam celu prezentaciju naš jezik, ali drago mi je da sam tu. Ministar Maćoz Han, gospođo Pak, dear friends and colleagues, thank you first for inviting the World Tourism Organization to be part of this amazing conversation. Yesterday was a very inspirational listening and debate and exchange. So today we are going to look what is the place of tourism in the future of the world and I can say in the future for people, the planet and our prosperity. But as well as the minister said, peaceful societies. I think this we have to understand very well. Now today, we are going to speak about a sector which is the third export earning category in the world after fuel and chemicals. This is in 2019. The sector is a complex ecosystem of economic activities, but most of them led by people and for people. So tourism futures, where they are, and how can we achieve the transformation for inclusive societies and prosperous economies while preserving the earth that sustains us? That's going to be our try to look into. So that I will need maybe, yes. Today we are facing a poly crisis. A poly crisis, and I'm very glad, I mean, I'm not going to stay long on those slides because I think that this was really addressed very well by our friend, Ms. Pat. The pandemic, the pandemic has brought a lot of disruption, but it has as well done one amazing achievement in positioning the sector and the importance of the tech sector for our economies and societies everywhere, not only in developing countries, but as well in our own countries uh, in Europe, for example. Climate threat, absolutely we see how much we depend on climate and how much now, today, energy dependency is putting a burden on how we can be more competitive for the tourism sector because cost of operation are increasing. And the military aggression against Ukraine, which has caused a lot of disruption and it's going to impact uh, globally uh, our economies, purchasing power, trends, choices for travel or not. 
Now, the challenge and the economic downturn, including the food crisis, the energy independency, job losses, loss of confidence of markets, but as well human capital shortage, because we have seen that during the crisis, many people have moved in other sectors. They have found themselves happy to work with decent work hours and a decent pay. And I think this, when it comes to policy making and to the new business model, we need to address it. We might raise salaries. We might raise, if not salaries, social benefits. We need to be creative. So I think that uh, environmental and social governance has really is, should be part of the future of what we are building uh, for, for, for tomorrow. Now, on the opportunities, we know that booking of flights and hotels are upswing. Uh, the demand has been above expectations from the beginning of the year and this summer. Prices have grown. Flights, prices of travel has as well increased. But despite all of this, the demand has increased as well. So basically, we are at the turning point where we need to match supply and demand uh, in a manner that is going to be satisfactory for the customer, but as well for the, for the, for the businesses. And then this has a huge impact on tourism governance. At the government level, restructuring of where tourism fits is happening everywhere. But as well, on the global level, we as a UN organization, among our sister agency, the sector is growing recognition and reputation. And that as well is a great opportunity, which we as an intergovernmental organization want our members to benefit, and consequently, as well, the private sector. Because we are one of the only organization that is a UN organization that deals with an economic sector. So that's quite particular. Now, what have we done? Sorry, pictures are small, but uh, intentions are big, and uh, support has been big as well. Now, we have, uh, from the beginning, from the inception of the crisis, actually on the 9th of March 2020, Secretary General Paul Kashvili was in Geneva, and I was at that time in charge of our liaison office there. We met Dr. Tedros, which announced the next day the pandemic. Now, we were very well prepared, anticipating of what was coming up. So the collaboration with our sister agency, especially the World Health Organization and the International Civil Aviation Organization, and many other partners, I will not want to name another one because I will miss and I will uh, put contrary to, to, to the people that have not been named. But we have put together a Global Tourism Crisis Committee, which has been driving UNWTO support to the sector for recovery and now as well for resilience and for the future to transform tourism. So data and intelligence have been at the forefront of the need of everyone. Understanding what's going on, uh, understanding how the neighbors are doing and understanding the, the trends as they come. Uh, the creation of tools which everybody was having access to or has access to even today has been uh, instrumental in everybody being able to monitor. We have as well seen increase of private sector sharing the data, which never happened before. Now, everybody saw the value of sharing. That as well is a change in the way we work now. On the policy and the governance as well, I think that uh, we have produced and guided the sector and countries in relook at their tourism scenario or ter tourism model. And when it comes to direct technical assistance, our methodologies have been used and by many other uh, implementing partners and donors and or multilateral donors in particular. Now, on the transformation and the future, I think that we are going to address it in the few coming slides. Now, I would share with you, um, because I was asked to do so, um, the trends. Now, as I said, um, our big and one of our strong value proposition is the capacity to have uh, a strong intelligence in policy and research uh, when it comes to data monitoring, that is a key. 
We have seen, and you all know those graphs, I'm sure that uh, you have seen them many times because we have done many Zooms, many interactive sessions online, and now today, really, it's a pleasure to, to see all of you. The crisis has been nothing to compare to the crisis in 2009. And uh, the deep dive uh, of the drop from 1.5 million to 400 mil billion, 400 million, uh, has brought us to 30 years back uh, as tourism was. But we can see as well that tourism is really showing resilience and we are picking up again. Now, overall impact on international tourists, as I said, 1.4 billion to 429 million uh, in 21. Things are evolving very well, uh, uh, changing in 2022. We will see that later in exports. Uh, the loss has not been as dramatic as international arrivals because uh, countries have adapted, jobs had to, field, to be filled, livelihood had to be preserved. So many countries have uh, developed, um, I can say, domestic tourism to compensate the international movement because it was not possible with the protocols in place. So basically, um, we have seen that the, the sector has been very reactive, but however, uh, a lot of losses. And the most remarkable is uh, remarkable in the negative sense, 1.9 billion uh, trillion loss in revenue, which have been impacting tourism direct GDP globally. Tourism global G GDP was 4% of world GDP. Now, when it comes to international arrivals, uh, we see that uh, regions, um, I think it's important that we place ourselves among the regions because our markets are coming from everywhere. And you all know that, for example, uh, the Asian market has been at a total standstill. Uh, so we had to reinvent the offer and the attractiveness of destinations because the protocols in place and the lockdowns in Asia have been severely impacting uh, all the markets in Europe. And um, Europe, because of the vaccination rate and because of uh, uh, the capacity to rebound in the support of SMEs and industry and, of course, jobs, uh, has been the, the, the fastest to recover. Now, when it comes to international arrivals, uh, I mean, this, uh, the red is in January to May. This is our July bar barometer. Um, with only minus 35%. We know that uh, um, concerning the summer season, many countries have now reached the point of 2019, and some have even gone above in Europe. So uh, that is um, an extremely important uh, message uh, uh, of hope, um, but, uh, but we need to be very cautious because... Uh, the, the poly crisis uh, and the multiple crises are really um, to be monitored very closely. Now, uh, when it comes to this is the same as arrivals. Now, recovery, um, the value of tourism in Europe has been plus 64%. That is the evaluation by the end of July, not uh, at the end of uh, the, the summer season. And uh, the world has only recovered 46%. So I can say we're really blessed because I think that uh, um, the capacity and the strong economies in Europe have allowed for the recovery to be much, uh, much more uh, um, rapid than, than in other destinations now. Asia and Pacific have only recovered 10%. So we hope that those markets are going to open and people to come to travel again. Now, as you know, uh, as I was explaining, uh, our intelligence and market, we, we have a barometer which everybody knows um, that is issued four times a year plus one edition at the beginning of the year, which gives an overview of the year performance. We have about 350 uh, tourism experts in all over the world, uh, public sector and private sector people identify for their competence and their capacity to provide an insight. The confidence index only six months ago was absolutely not at the level of where we are today. And I think that uh, many have been anticipating that uh, slow recovery for Europe, for example, would be only in 2023, 24. And now we see that that uh, perception has changed. Now we see that above uh, five to six percent are looking at 22 levels and uh, 23 uh, and 24 
that was the anticipated uh, forecast. Now, when it comes to international arrivals, the world is performing extremely well. We know that, uh, and you all know, island destinations have been suffering the most because uh, they, they high dependency on, uh, on tourism. Some of them, 70% of the GDP is tourism, uh, have been extremely affected with very little means to support industries and, and livelihoods uh, in the same time, not the same capacity as developed uh, countries such as in, in the EU, for example. So the, um, the, the creativity and the new governance models have emerged, like led by the head of state, for example. I always like to mention Dominican Republic because I think it is a country that has been incredibly rebounding, um, performing, outperforming today more than it was in 2019 with an incredible flow of new investments. So the, the tourism governance is really a key in how to drive the rebound, the transformation of the sector for being more inclusive to benefit more societies and of course the economy. So, does it want? Mm, maybe I do that. It's blocked, sorry. Yes, I wanted to show Europe. <laughs> Next. No. Oh. Okay, thank you so much. So, in Europe, we can see that the graph shows us that uh, the rebound has been much higher. And of course, this is all due uh, to uh, the high level of vaccination and the lifting of uh, travel restrictions. Now, when it comes to travel restrictions, today 72 countries have no travel restrictions at all. And that is quite remarkable. Those countries represent 47% uh, of the global market share of the tourism rebound. So 72 countries represent almost half of the numbers of tourism arrivals today in the period from January to 25th of August. We took it uh, the latest, oh, 11th of August, sorry. So that is uh, as well showing that uh, uh, close monitoring of um, measures and protocols is very important, uh, of course, as well as the level of vaccination. Now, I just wanted to have a, uh, to, for us to have a deep dive and, and a look and on what are the travel behaviors today. Now, people uh, are getting closer and for a longer stay. They, this is why uh, tourism receipts have not suffered as much as number of arrivals. And people like, for example, even to go by car today. And this is why I think Slovenia has benefited immensely in during the season, because many customers are just coming from another country in Europe. Getaway, not nature, rural tourism, and road trips have emerged. That is well, I can say, you are very well placed here, and many destinations in Europe are completely revitalizing the rural sector. Uh, more responsible, people are more demanding. We have all seen that we can do anything to travel. You remember, I mean, we all had masks from the moment we leave the house to the moment we arrive in, a, in our room, if we can get a room, or if we can travel in a hotel. So basically, this flexibility and adaptation that, uh, that people have shown has impacted on the way and the perception we have on the responsibility that we have when we travel. So the demand for more responsible products is there. And then new concerns, people want to be um, uh, feeling safe um, and um, they want more flexibility on the cancellation policy. I just want to mention as well a very key work that, uh, uh, that has been uh, achieved by the organization, and I think Alessandra had a lot to do in that, uh, is uh, the Global Code for the Protection of Tourists, which is now adopted by many countries, which is now a regulatory framework for companies uh, to, to engage and, of course, for countries to support uh, because flexibility in the purchase uh, is very important to be protected. Now, what is the outlook for the future? Lifting COVID travel restriction and opening in Asia, this is uh, going to be uh, on, the, on the positive side. 
uh, the US euro exchange rate. I think that uh, many European destinations have really heavily benefited from the advantages uh, exchange rate from the US. Pent up demand and household savings, even though uh, I can say there is a, there is a chill there because uh, it's not evident that people are going to make this decision to travel, um, looking at what the economic downturn is going to, to bring us. And as well, we have seen an incredible investor's confidence uh, in the first uh, um, headquarter, um, quarter, we have seen a strong hotel investment activity surpassing uh, the 2019 by 0.5%. Now, as I said earlier, on the negative and on the challenges, the workforce shortage and operational challenges, this is everywhere. A slowdown in economic growth and risk recession in key European markets. Uh, record high inflation, some countries are above 8 nine in Europe, uh, hike in interest rates and squeezing living conditions. So the uncertainty can generate wait and see attitude and this is the risk we need to understand. Now, I will address four or five points uh, on what we see for the future and how we can address it and how the organization is leading that work and in which we're really happy that all of you engage. Tourism transformation. I think that the acceleration to green and inclusive growth is really one key question. We need to start from the beginning. If we want to measure growth, and if we want to measure sustainability, we need to have the instruments for. And the Measuring Sustainable Tourism Framework, a statistical framework that UNW2 is leading, it's an initiative that is in the making. Many of the partners around the room here are part of that, uh, of that work is going to be adopted, hopefully, by the UN Statistical Commission in about a year or two. And that is going to give a framework and, a, I can say, harmonized um, methodology for measuring the economic, social, and environmental impact of tourism uh, for, for the economies and the societies. So that is... Um, a, key, uh, a key work in which uh, governments are engaged, are going to lobby with the UN, and I know that uh, Slovenia is very active. Uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs yesterday was explaining how much uh, ambition uh, Slovenia has to be really an active partner of the UN. Now, there is one other very important uh, flagship drive and initiative called One Planet Network for Sustainable Tourism. This is, again, a UN-led initiative with the United Nations Environment Program, but with a lot of partners. This is going to run for the next 10 years as, I can say, the main drive uh, of an integrated approach to sustainability. The, um, the future as we said, needs to address climate action. And the roadmap for the climate action has been launched in Glasgow last year with the Glasgow Declaration on Climate Action. More than 700 signatories so far, government, private sector, um, companies, but as well CSO, civil society organization, networks, and association. Then the Global Tourism Plastic Initiative, because uh, we need to look at the oceans, um, because the oceans are a vital lung for, for carbon sequestration, but as well for opportunities to develop uh, tourism. 40% of the world tourism is happening in coastal area. And uh, the global roadmap on food weight re reduction as well, I think that when we speak about the food crisis, we have to look as well at different models on how we serve food in the, in the, in the hotel industry. So our call to action is to align, enable, and multiply. So I invite you very much to explore more on, on our website, and we are there to respond to any questions further down the line if you're interested. Now, tourism uh, is a high priority sector in the new global strategy on sustainable consumption and production. This One Planet program is based on SCP. It's the Sustainable Development Goal 12, uh, which explicitly mentions tourism, such as 8 on economic development and 14 on the life above the sea. Now, this is just a snapshot. I know it's written small, but the presentation is going to be available, I think, after. So this is our roadmap to COP27. We are going to produce a number of technical paper, policy paper, and we're going to hold climate talks uh, for government and private sector to understand well uh, how we can act and what we should do and integrate in our business model or policies uh, to be um, 
to be taking advantage of climate action for reducing, uh, for creating sustainability and, and, and building competitiveness. Now, innovation is at the forefront of the future. Um, UNWTO has been proven to be extremely active in that field in scaling up innovation. We have a number of challenges. I'm sure many of you know about it. And uh, we are um, really driving that agenda um, globally, but as well in the UN. And this year, we are transforming uh, those challenges into much more deep dive, um, I can say, capacity building. We are offering a digital futures for SMEs program in partnership with uh, technology partners, assessing your readiness in, in taking full advantage of the digitalization and uh, providing uh, support and training. Uh, we have these tourism tech adventures that are really uh, can be global, regional, thematic, or national. Uh, startup competition, same, can be global, national. We have one currently uh, uh, running, is a Tourism Awake, is on SDGs. Innovation challenges as well, and uh, um, many activities which are currently hosted in our regional office for the Middle East. Now, this is a little bit the global roadmap when it comes to the UN sphere and the global agenda and uh, where tourism fits. Uh, we have a number of partners we work with because we see the value. One of them is the ETC. Um, I think uh, Mr. Santander here is, is going to, to, to enlighten us on, on the work you do, but I think that uh, this is certainly one of the most trusted partners we have uh, when it comes to Europe, besides the World Economic Forum, the OECD, and other global partners. And um, uh, during the G20 this year in Indonesia, on the 26th of um, September, tourism ministers are going to meet from the G20 countries and beyond, and we are going to look and have a deep dive on understanding what government should do for SMEs, opportunities and challenges, and how we need to support enterprises, because uh, they, these are vital uh, actors of the sector. Without uh, tourism SMEs, there is no tourism. 80% actually of tourism is made of SMEs. And of course, uh, COP27, where we are going to unveil and continue our, our advocacy effort and uh, um, exchanges moving forward in the climate action sphere. Now, I just wanted to, uh, to share with you that uh, for the first time in history, uh, that tourism is part of the global agenda. Uh, we were in uh, New York at the UN General Assembly Hall, which many of us have seen so many times because uh, since the Ukraine crisis hit, there has been so many votes in that, uh, I can say, historical room. Um, UNWTO uh, has organized a high-level thematic debate for an entire day with the president of the General Assembly. Our intention is to continue and to try to have a momentum every year uh, on, uh, uh, at the UN General Assembly. I think this is only bringing an amazing visibility and opportunity for member states of the UN uh, to understand and to recognize the importance of the sector. And here, I think, as I said earlier, successful destinations which have recovered and which are on the path to transformation have been the ones that have been the most agile in uh, changing the governance pattern. And I think that, uh, as I just mentioned, the UN General Assembly and UNW2 role is really to be the catalyst of, uh, of that change, uh, spreading and sharing uh, the best business model, the best policy spheres, and the best governance models among uh, its member states and of course, of course, uh, involving the private sector. Now, um, we, is, uh, we are UN, but we are strongly uh, uh, working with European Union, and again, our director for uh, the Europe region, Alessandra Priante, is driving that agenda, and she's going to be with us later on the panel. And the contribution we have made on the transition pathway for tourism was published in 2022, and maybe Slovenia can make another push when uh, it comes to the next uh, phase that uh, tourism is, uh, UNWTO is more recognized to the contribution we are making to the EU because in the UN we are recognized in the EU, not always. We are coming through the door, but uh, so this is a political call, maybe not concerning everyone, but I think the message can pass through and other countries present. Um, and the ETC UNWTO dashboard, I take it as a flagship, but uh, uh, there's many more and much more that we do with ETC. 
coordinating our strategic alliances, I can say, I spoke about it with uh, UN entities and beyond, uh, and the creation and the contribution to the OECD blueprint and the WEF uh, Tourism Development Index. Now, um, with uh, the G20, I just explained, we're going to have resilience building for SMEs and um, global UN standard setting with the measuring sustainable tourism and the International Code for the Protection of Tourists. This is just a recap on uh, uh, what is ahead of us, uh, as well on the UNW2 Academy, uh, scaling up tourism education, 360 degree footprint, uh, the Global Center for Tourism and Rural Development, and uh, building an innovative finance architecture, our upcoming integration of the work of our affiliate members. If we have affiliate members here, I think that uh, uh, the, the program of work is quite uh, um, intense. Now, again, from the beginning to the end, I think that uh, why, what we want to discuss today is really how we can achieve a tourism transformation. And I think that uh, we said it already, but I think investing in people is number one priority. Um, human capital and education, uh, foster sustainable and green transition, boost investment, enhance competitiveness, and scale up innovation. I thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Morosevic. So it's really good to have all representatives of major global stakeholders in tourism here, including UNWTO. Uh, uh, Mrs. Sorosovic started her presentation in Serbian, which is a closely co connected uh, language, and uh, we know uh, how big impact uh, the Serbians had on, on, let's say, the world, especially Serbian experts like Mr. Rosevich or Nikola Tesla, for example, who actually um, started his career in, in, uh, in Slovenia, in Maribor. It made him rethink a little bit his career, and he was so successful then. And of course, don't forget that the inventor of the, Slo of the famous Blit um, cream cake is actually the Serbian expert, uh, Istvan Lukacevic in the 50s, who came from Serbia, from northern Serbia, where there is a, a big Hungarian minority, and he invented the, um, the cream cake, and uh, because the, the languages are are connected Serbian and, and Slovenian. He actually kept his secret notes in Hungarian because he was uh, partly of Hungarian origin. So the cream cake recipe was quite secret uh, for some time, but now we know it and we're happy for it. Um, our next uh, speaker uh, with another interesting presentation, uh, which will then open uh, the, the panel, is Mr. Luis Araujo um, from the European Travel Commission. He's the president of the ETC and also the CEO of Turismo de uh, Portugal. Uh, so there will be a European view with the beautiful Portuguese touch, and everybody loves Portugal, including uh, Slovenia. So, Mr. Araujo, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Igor. Um, <clears throat> well, first of all, thank you to the Minister of Economy. It's my third time in Slovenia in just one year. So someone in Portugal is starting to think bad things about me, or at least that I have a second family here, which I don't. Um, <clears throat> but it's wonderful to be here, and it's beautiful to be here in Bled and to share with you the challenges of the future. Thank you, Maya, for the invitation once again. It's, uh, it's so good to work with the Slovenian Tourism Board. And uh, for us, uh, and I have to tell you this, it's a role model in terms of working sustainability issues and working destinations. So thank you, and it's wonderful to be here. So, moving forward. Instability is the only constant. Um, instability is a very negative word. And uh, we all know what is happening in the world. We all know that we have huge challenges ahead. But I'm going to talk about what we can do, all of us, collectively, the ones inside this room or independently. Because some things are so high level, so out in the sky, uh, that we have to focus on what we can do. And I brought you uh, a few ideas of what we think in Portugal, inside the European Travel Commission, uh, of what we can do, private sector, public sector, all together. So I changed, and of course, I've, I've followed the right Heraclitus sentence, change is the only constant. And I'm going to talk about change, how things are changing, 
but also how we have to change in order to address those challenges. And sometimes that's the most difficult part. We always ask someone to change, we forget ourselves. We also have to change. And I bring you a few examples. The first one is very clear, talking about change, nothing better than age. 50 years later, uh, we change. <laughs> and, uh, and this is real, because change happens every day, so we better address them. And we had a few examples uh, these past two years of changes. After growing immensely, every destination in Europe was growing. Um, in Portugal, just to give you an example, we grew 60%, 6-0, our revenues in just four years. We hit a record of 27 million guests we never had. And we diversified markets as we never diversified, especially from long-haul destinations. This was 2019, and we thought we were living, all of us, Slovenia also, we thought we were living the best time of our years. But things changed once again. And um, there was a big example of how things changed and how we adapted to that change. When we see these, a few examples of how we changed the way we looked for tourists uh, in terms of segments, talking to digital nomads, to long stays, to long-haul destinations that searched for a place to spend their holidays, or uh, a month or two or three or four uh, of getting away of what was happening in our country, although this was happening in the entire world. Um, and to tell you the truth, we were the most affected, if, uh, affected because we were not able to deal with this change. And we were not able to pass the message that our sector was important. Um, uh, uh, but we changed. And I, I brought you a few examples. Uh, talking to our internal market, uh, something that we had never done, at least in Portugal. We left the internal market because we always thought that it was for granted. Well, it isn't. And it was a wonderful surprise, and I think you have the same here in Slovenia. Or talking to our very close neighbors, as, as many of these countries did. So this was also, and we were able to do this change, so we, were, we will surely be able to address the changes and the challenges that I'm, I'm bringing uh, a little bit um, later. Another example of our country. Uh, we changed so much that we've decided to take the boldest decision ever, which was saying, this is not the time to come to our country. So we told everyone this. Hopefully. There was a video here? No? Yes. Life is whatever we make it. The traveler is the journey. What we see is not what we see, but who we are. The world. What is the world, oh my love? The garden of my verses, all in bloom. Nothing gives the idea of the constancy of character, like the firmness of walking through seas men never sailed before. The end of one journey is simply the start of another. You have to see what you missed the first time. Let's read Portugal. Change. This was one of the biggest challenges we had in Tourism of Portugal. Uh, telling someone, and we've been telling everyone, like all of us, come, visit us, join us, experience us. This was a time to tell them, just stay home and read about us. Um, and it's an example, as many, and I'm sure many of you have examples like this in your enterprise, in your business, in your uh, organization, of this kind of situations. But I'm going directly to the challenges, if the pointer is, ah, now I know I have to, to point here. So preparing for change. The good news, it only depends on us. 
The bad news, sometimes we don't have the help we need. And this is really important. Because um, over these two years, we heard things like, oh, tourism is really important for any destination, any country. In, inside ETC, we heard this everywhere. It's important. Uh, it contributes to our GDP. Long promises of long-lived tourism after COVID, because we need tourism. What's new? Things came back. We're going back to the normal. And we forget, and we need support, financial support from governments, from the European Commission, for small and very small enterprises in any country inside Europe. And this has to be said every day to every government, to every institution, because things haven't stopped. And we need help for the challenges that we have for the future. And preparing for the change, I have five big changes. We have to take the lead and act. We're always seen like this, either the victims or the villains of this. Tourism is the big uh, cause for what's happening in the world, right? So we always hear uh, we're uh, uh, the biggest threat for climate change, we don't change, we don't take decisions. Um, so we have to take things differently. And Thank God we have some very good examples of what is happening inside Europe about this. Tourism on an organizational level and destination management is changing. And many of these programs are wonderful examples. But they're worth nothing if the private sector doesn't align with this. If each people doesn't align with this. If any consumer or tourist doesn't think this is important. Because all these efforts um, will just bring us to the other slides. We will keep being the victims of, of what's happening in the world or the villains of what's happening in the world. And we don't want to be that. So I would say this is the biggest challenge that we have in front of us. The second one is how to grow our community. And when I, grow, and when I talk about growing our community, um, I, I'm talking about this. We're getting old. Um, in, in, in 30 years, we will have almost half of the European population over 55 years. What used to be, we used to have in 2000, uh, four people working for one retired people. By 2050, we will have two people working for one retired people. This is not acceptable. And we have to talk about this because our sector is affected by this. Um, and how do we deal with this? Well, three options. Migration. We have so many people that want to come to Europe. Let's embrace them. Let's give them training. Let's help them, include them in our societies. We have so many refugee camps. Who wants to open a hotel school inside a refugee camp and bring people to our countries? We have to talk about this and discuss this. And these are the challenges that we have to think differently in order to change. The second one, EU visa policy. We will have a new system, a new visa policy system inside Europe. I hope it will be for the best. We cannot live closed anymore. And if we don't think about this, trust me, by 2050 it will be too late. The third thing to grow our community has to do with our own community, our sector. And we have to attract the ones that have left. We, we, left, uh, we had 1.2 million uh, people leaving the sector inside Europe. 1.2 million. And they didn't left because they found something better. Well, some of them did. They left because they were frustrated. Because uh, they didn't have the right salary or the right career plan or the right benefits or the right attention that they needed. Um, and we need to think this completely in a complete different way in order to attract and keep those who work for us. So growing our community is uh, uh, the second big change. The third one is our people. And we don't take care of our people. I'm sorry to say this. I have um, uh, a slide about What's the employment in tourism inside the European Union? And you see 58% of people employed in tourism are women. The, uh, all economic activities is 46, so we are a female activity. 
uh, but I have a challenge also for that. 29% um, uh, are in job for less than two years, 23% against 19 in part-time, 18% against 17 in lower education. Give you the example of Portugal, 60% of our uh, working staff, and we're talking about 350,000 people, has minimum basic teaching, 60%. 60%. Basic teaching means nine years of scholarship. It's not new to Portugal. I'm sure that many of European countries have the same. So we have to change this. And second, um, foreign citizens, 13 against 8, but a huge opportunity, young people, 9% against 7% in other economic activities. This is where we should focus. Um, and we have some wonderful news from uh, the European Union. Um, for the first time, tourism was considered one of the industries to have a transition pathway. Uh, the first transition pathway, yes, we will have funding. Once again, the funding has to reach everyone. The funding has to reach every activity inside tourism. It's not just hotels that want to be built in big destinations. It's every small enterprise that is in our country. So we need also trust from that side. And the second, the Pact for Skills. Finally, we will have a great pact and funding also to support skills and support training in our sector. So what, what can we do once again? And I'm happy to be part of a big team like the one below and the right side in Portugal uh, and from the European Commission on the left side that is focused on this. And although most of our uh, organizations deal with promotion, we're pretty much changing our mindset and thinking that sometimes it's better to think on these other things because they will impact our promotion. And in order to do, that, to do this, I bring you four ideas. The first one, support diversity. It's not possible to have 58% of women working in the sector, but then their salaries, the average salary, is 10 to 20% lower than those salaries of the men. Why? Because most of the high-level uh, hierarchy of our businesses, organizations, governments, related with tourism, are occupied by men. This has to change. Win-win um, training. We often focus on training as something that is good for our enterprise, that will help us be more profitable or more efficient. Wrong. We have to think of training as something that is good for our employee. And this assessment, this evaluation has to be done by every organization, every enterprise, every businessman. Third, add value. We don't add value to our employees, to our workers, uh, and we always think of adding value to our customers. We forget sometimes that if we don't do that, we will hardly retain those who work for us. And the fourth one, I'm sure loyalty programs, every company has one. Uh, and we've developed the most sophisticated loyalty programs and cards and models to attract and retain consumers. Well, it's time to create a loyalty program for our workers, for those who work for us. So if we do this, maybe, maybe we will retain and, and grow our community, but also take care of ours uh, very clearly. The fourth point is this. We have to innovate and create. And innovation is important, yes, but the only way we can have innovation if, if, is if we feel these three items. It has to be data-based, sustainability-driven, and human-centered. If we don't do, if, the, if innovation and creativity is not human-centered, it's not worth it. And sometimes we focus on technology and on digital just for the sake, once again, of operation, on the operational side. Um, so, this is something that for us it's really important because when we think about innovation and when we think about creativity, we have to challenge ourselves to the way we promote our countries, the way we promote our enterprise. Who do we talk to? Where do we go to do promotion? Should we be doing the same things we've done over the past years? 
I think it's better to change or at least think of some changes. The final uh, challenge is this. And yesterday it was amazing to hear, I will never pronounce the name, Zizek? Zizek. Um, good. Um, it was amazing to hear him um, and, and, and to listen to him. Because when we think about this, the values of the European Union, these are our values. The first picture uh, was taken 50 years ago in uh, the island of Madeira. I was brought up in a place that is one of the most touristic destinations uh, in Portugal and maybe in the world. Uh, and 50 years ago, it was very different, of course. But it was a huge destination. Um, we are used to live with other people, with other nationalities. Uh, many of my parents' friends, uh, they met them at the restaurant or in the street because they needed help, and they helped them. This is what the European Union means. And if you look at this, it's exactly the same as our values, as our purpose, as an activity. So there is no doubt whatsoever that tourism has a role to play in this. So if we have a role to play, if we are an activity that supports so many jobs and helps so many people to get together inside our country or outside our country, then um, we have a bigger mission than the one we are uh, discussing here or the one the, that we are doing in our destination or in our company. I think this is the right moment uh, to say, uh, mostly because we're living uh, a big threat to this. And, and yesterday was a big example on, on how this is threatening. Um, we're seeing movements rising everywhere in Europe. For the first time in Portugal, we have the extreme right as the third biggest party in our country. Uh, and they are sitting in the parliament. And I grew up in, the, in an island where, where I was used to talk to anyone, to accept everyone, to think freely and speak freely and love whoever I wanted. So if we don't accept this and if we don't think this is the biggest threat to our activity, but this is also the biggest challenge that we can support, we won't be successful in these changes. And I leave you with a sentence from Arthur C. Clarke, because sometimes we focus on this superior science and we forget that we have some inferior mor morals inside of us that we have uh, to improve. If we don't balance this, then we will have instability and we will be self-destroyed. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Araujo. Of course, we also love uh, Portuguese literature and we love the Portuguese language because it's one of the few languages, actually, Portuguese and, and Spain, which brings Slovenia a little bit uh, uh, higher on the alphabet order because they say Slovenia. So we always have to wait for so long till we get to the S at the Olympic Games opening, for example. So thank you. Portugal and, and Spain too. So, uh, but, but it was anyway a really fantastic introduction uh, for what we will discuss in, in the uh, upcoming hour. I'm really happy to announce our uh, panelists. Ladies first, uh, Professor Alessandra Priante, the Director of the Regional Department for Europe at the UNWTO. An applause. <laughs> then Miss Violeta Bultz, four characters, um, uh, founder and curator of Eco-Civilization, but of course, the former commissioner for <laughs> mobility and transport in the European Commission, then from the United States, the president and the CEO of the United States Tour Operators Association, um, <laughs> Mr. Terry Dale. Then, of course, Mr. Eric Dressa, uh, the secretary general of the European Travel Agents and Tour Operators Association. Welcome, Mr. Treza, and last but not least, Mr. Mateusz Frangesz, the State Secretary at the Ministry of Economic Development and Technology of the Republic of Slovenia. I have to mention that Mr. Frangesz, yes, of course, an applause. 
has another meeting starting at 12, so he will probably uh, uh, leave early before we get to the questions from the audience. So, so that's why I start with you, uh, Mr. Frankisch. We had two really fantastic presentations w with a lot, um, let's say, suggestions how how to do it in the future. But, but of course, we, we have to, and that would be our first uh, topic, action recovery in the COVID-19 follow-up, and we don't know what, what's, what's coming actually in, in, in autumn. So uh, what's the Slovenian government doing right now to make this recovery successful and to prepare for new challenges uh, which we're facing now, war, energy crisis, uh, climate crisis, which is a, an eternal crisis. So what are you doing right now? And please uh, um, take into account that you have to be a little bit closer to the microphone because we're live streaming this too. So uh, I would like also the international audience to, to hear that. Thank you, Mr. Bergant, for your difficult question. Uh, but this I'll is reflect to ask a to, politician difficult to, questions. To okay. both of the presentations, because I think uh, both showed uh, an excellent roadmap. First, uh, Mrs. Urošević, uh, I think it's very data-driven and also reflects on the uh, consumer behavior. And here's the first good news for the Slovenian tourism. If you look what people are demanding in the post-COVID time, Yes, we fit the picture perfectly. And second, thank you for the inspiration of your uh, presentation, Mr. Araujo. Um, and we are doing, doing exactly that. Well, it is very well structured in five uh, steps. But I would say that during COVID, Slovenian state intervened uh, massively to um, help the tourism sector. Second, we are now uh, in the middle of a big investment process. First, 70 million euros of grants uh, for the restructuring of our mountain centers, ski centers, uh, to be able to offer a 365 days of outdoor activities for uh, their guests. Even winter without snow? Even winter without snow. Okay. <laughs> However, we count on it, okay? Uh, plus, we are just before releasing another massive tender of 70 million uh, to help um, refurbish or build new uh, capacities for uh, guests. This is what I learned from Mrs. Araujo's uh, uh, presentation. We have to invest. We have to help small and medium-sized businesses uh, to overcome the threats we face. But let me be very clear. I think that in this decade, we have to learn to live with all the uncertainties um, that we will face the culmination effect of different crises from the pandemic to the energy sector, and we can foresee another crisis uh, in the years to come. Uh, but what is essential that we build a flexible models uh, that, for example, for Slovenia as a country, no matter how it shakes, we have to be stable in our flexibility. But for do this flexibility, we have to invest in people, we have to improve our attitude towards the environment, mm -hmm. toward uh, society, and so on, uh, to build a more robust model that will uh, live through the future crisis. But we'll speak about people with later. I, I would like to hear from, from Mr. Dale uh, the perspective from, from the United States. Uh, uh, how do you see the impact of, let's say, COVID crisis uh, to tourism uh, in, in the States? And of course, how do you see Europe uh, from your perspective, uh, Europe which is facing um, a terrible war in, in Ukraine after the, the Russian uh, aggression? Does this also affect uh, uh, U.S. tourism, especially tourists who 
who come to Europe and they, they, have, they have returned. We, we see them. Well, that's a big question. <laughs> and I almost feel like I need to stand up to address it, but I'll do my best. <laughs> you're, you're, you're free to do it. I, I'll do my best from my chair here. And let me just say, uh, this is my first real visit to Slovenia. What took me so long? Mm -hmm. Because in the 24 hours, or I actually think it's been less than that, uh, I am so amazed and so in love and it's that passion that you get from people who call this country home. And that's critical. So I am so happy to be here. I forgot your question, but anyway. <laughs> so I know it's something like COVID. You, your, your answer is far better than my question. <laughs> but, so go on, go on. So, so COVID and the war. I am pretty darn bullish about the US traveler right now, even though we see inflation at record levels. Uh, but what we've learned is through COVID, people place a higher value on travel. So they're willing to forego X, whatever X might be, so that they can travel. So I think and believe that the future for Slovenia and Europe is pretty darn healthy and optimistic. Now, um, has 2022 materialized in the way that my members had hoped? <laughs> Not quite. Not quite. But it's better than obviously we've gone through the last couple of years. 2023, we expect and anticipate, will meet 2019, uh, which tells us that the US traveler is going there. And just so everyone in this room understands, Europe is everything to at least our members. So when we do an annual survey of where are your customers going, top 20, 15, 14, 16, I mean, it varies a little year by year, but the vast majority are going to Europe, and that is not going to change. And I think in times of challenges like we are operating in today and yesterday and will in the future, Europe is our bread and butter, and Europe is where we want to go and we will go. So I don't know whether I that answered your question, but <laughs> COVID, is not, COVID is not impacting our travel experiences and expectations uh, today like it did, obviously. Your answer was, was great. Of course, of course, the relation between euro and dollar is, is somehow uh, favorable for, for, uh, for guests from the United States. Totally. This could change, of course. Uh, it could. It could, but I'm not an expert on those fluctuations in currency exchanges, but I'll just go back to my premise. Um, regardless of those fluctuations, uh, Americans are going to travel, and they're going to travel to Europe. That's, that's good news, and you're always welcome. You didn't pay me to say that. No, no, no. OK. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> not yet. So, so uh, Mr. Treza, uh, how do you see it from, from the European point of view, especially because we know that, that uh, travel agencies have suffered tremendously in, in, in uh, last year. So is, is the recovery occurring right now? How, how do you see the situation right now? Uh, was, was the response from the industry, um, let's say, appropriate? Okay. Um, I mean, we'll be short on the, on the sufferings of the industry because everybody has been affected um, basically the same, same way. The recovery is uh, higher as expected. Um, yet we've seen um, that the disturbances in the whole ecosystem um, that has an impact today, uh, namely um, airports and airlines issues. I mean, you have all heard um, all the um, shortcomings uh, when people wanted to travel to your destinations, to your countries uh, from Northern Europe. Um, and this has had a huge impact on the, on the travel within Europe. Uh, we estimate about 20 impact on, on the revenue of travel agents mm -hmm. um, and, and tour operators by 20% um, in July and August. So it's, 
it's it's tremendous, um, tremendously high. The um, the idea um, is that we we're happy about the way things are developing, but um, there's a lot of things that we need to recover um, from. We have, as uh, the two first speakers mentioned, uh, a labor shortage, which is a big issue. Uh, I was just looking at some figures before coming. Um, in France, for instance, half of the uh, travel agent and tour operators have um, at least two or three open positions uh, in their company. Remember that when you talk about uh, online travel agent, these are big companies, but many of the travel agent and tour operators are small scale SMEs, mm -hmm. so this is a, a huge impact. So um, the, the, um, the perspective today is, um, is not, that, um, not that easy. Um, on top, and I want to remind on what Terry said, um, we are always focused on the European market. Yes, we can travel within Europe. And uh, we have many beautiful destinations as, as Bled mm -hmm. uh, or Portugal. Um, but and the surroundings of Bled, which is called Slovenia. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard about that one too. Um, but we not there uh, as regards international travel. Um, US, USA is, um, I think, before um, the pandemic, it was about, for European travel advisors, um, 14 million people traveling to US per year, equivalent to 30 billion euros. Um, we estimate this year at um, um, an average uh, 9 to 10 million mm -hmm. Uh, people traveling. So you see that there is still a huge gap. And this is where um, we need to, to work on the coming years because it's where the margins for the industries are. Mm -hmm. So We'll speak about the perspectives and then solutions later on. Uh, Mrs. Priante, you, you announced really, let's say, bold statements from you here uh, today, especially when it comes to, let's say, the, the, the shortage of, 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 I wouldn't say uh, labor force, but people uh, working in, in the industry. It, it's a big issue. I don't know if this is also, Mr. Dale, a big issue in the United States. It is? Huge. Huge. Okay. okay. So we, we share the problem. So, so, I mean, what have we done wrong before uh, the uh, uh, pandemic and, and all the crisis? And what can we do right, right now to, to attract more people to work in the in the industry, we, we saw some solutions, but but, but how to do it on, on the short term? Because countries, even within Europe, are actually virtually fighting for 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 stuff to be attracted. First of all, let me start with a bold statement. Okay, I love you. You're amazing as a moderator. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> I mean, it's only the beginning no, no, no. of the moderation, I, I, no, no, no. so I mean... I have to remember that line, so every <laughs> panel that I'm on, I'm going to start with, I love you. <laughs> I love you. And hence, the rest of it is a piece of cake. We so have brilliant. just, we, we, brilliant. we could just set a new but trend, that's, that, international That's why trend. they came to Slovenia, right? Yeah, yeah. Slovenia has because, love in its name. Yeah, that's yeah, where yeah, you yeah. learn yeah. about love. <laughs> Thank you. And because volleyball is very, one of the very special sports of, uh, of Slovenia, yeah, have... she immediately got my ball and slammed it because that's what I wanted to, uh, wanted to come to. So thank you for that. that. That was amazing. And it wasn't planned. It wasn't scripted. No, no. <laughs> so um, the other second bold statement I want to make, and this is a, a kind invitation to the uh, land around Bled called Slovenia, to really you be bold. Bled Strategic Forum has to be the new Davos for tourism. What happens in Bled politically in this time of the year, every single year has an impact that people remember. Uh, yesterday was dramatically uh, unforgettable. Not just because of the Ukraine element, it's because how people feel. I often see politicians speaking and I'm sure you do more than me. But to see them how they speak in Blit, they speak comfortably, they speak, they, have, they feel like they can see things that they normally wouldn't say in their homeland, and they feel maybe it's because it's after summer, so just after a beautiful vacation, people feel better, so they say, you know what, I'm gonna say it. I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna step further. At the end of the day, this is my job. 
And so I really think you should capitalize on that because one thing we need to change, and we were just talking about it yesterday with my wonderful group of you know, co-panelists, especially with Maya, we need to stop talking. It's, we need to really change the face of talking and action consequences. I like the fact that we're sitting down and we started with a, a state secretary who said, we are investing because this is like, I'm speaking actions. So, especially in Europe, both, well, Luis is lucky because he also has the hat of dealing with one of the most beautiful countries in the world, and you Slovenia. Love him, and you love him too. No, well, I love him first. I love him first, so, you know, that's... Um, of course, but because you've never been to Portugal. That's why, you know. No, but I'm joking. The thing is that um, we really need to to make sure that whatever we're saying in these conferences, whatever you, we're achieving every time we bring people together, whether it's physical, whether it's local, regional, uh, it's global, streamed, so it should reach everybody. It really not only leaves a mark and people say, oh, that was a good conference, that was a good speaker, but also motivates people to act. And in order for us to do that, as was mentioned earlier, we really need to be completely together. There's no, the thing that which is really important about labor shortage, and I'm gonna get to you mm. on that, is that we really need to make sure that we're acting together. We're not speaking to the European Commission, to the European uh, interlocutors, we're speaking with them. It means they need to come to us and understand fully. And if they don't understand, we're gonna insist until they do. Mm -hmm. Because it's impossible that in the European institutions, tourism is still a small unit in uh, X, Y, Z, blah, 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 and tourism. It's impossible. Because tourism, we can keep on saying it's a horizontal sector, it's a large sector, it includes a lot. Tourism is much more than what we've been communicating via our data. Because if we pile up all the other uh, aggregated sector, let's start cruises, for example. We got the whole shipping industry related to it. And it's because of tourism. If there's no tourism, there's no ships being built, there's no jobs being given. And I don't want to get into the element of are cruises good or not. I'm just talking about industries. And industries have, this industry in particular, the tourism industry has something which is completely different from everyone else. It's a human-based industry with no people, there's no tourism. And I'm not just talking about the tourists and the workers, it's the people. It's when you come and somebody communicates you something about their own country. So to go back to your, to your question, mm -hmm. what are we supposed to do? <clears throat> there's not one single recipe, but there needs to be a dramatic change of perspective. We've been looking at things in the wrong way for too long. I do not personally like when people say we recovered the numbers of 2019 or maybe we've exceeded, because I always respond by saying, were the numbers of 2019 the right numbers? Because let's not forget that when we ended 2019, people, a lot of people, especially in cities, were hating tourism. Mm. So that we have to go back to that and go back to that challenge to understand that we need to motivate people. I agree. <laughs> Let me just, I, I want to pick up on a, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Too, way. <laughs> you don't know me yet, but I love you too. All right, so I have refused for the most part to using the word recovery mm -hmm. because we, are, we should not, as a tourism industry, strive to recover to 2019. This is our opportunity to reimagine how travel can truly impact in a very positive way communities, neighborhoods, job development, you name it. So I just wanted to, it's, it's not about recovery. It's about reimagining. Sorry. Recreation. So we need to, when I say we need to motivate people, when we're speaking, first of all, we need to look to the younger ones. We mm -hmm. are obliged to do that, but we need to motivate them. 
because tourism is the only industry, the only job opportunity that allows them to proudly represent, receive, uh, communicate, and showcase the beauty of their own country, beauty of themselves as well. Let it be a small village, let it be the capital of the country. Great. And now to Ms. Ms. Bulls. Well, you also deal with young people, young talents. You were in the European Commission. <laughs> well, what went wrong years ago that, that tourism has, hasn't got, let's say, a proper place? That's one question. The second one is, well, because you, you were in charge of, of transport in, in, in Europe, how, how do you see the current situation, which was mentioned by Mr. Dresen, the, the, the really fantastic problem of, of um, air travel, and then travel in, in, in also within Europe in this new situation in general? Well, thank you very much. Uh, the fact that I've been invited to this panel is very encouraging, because we've heard today a lot about people customers, innovation, services. I haven't seen anybody speaking about infrastructure, and uh, which is the basics of everything. I mean, how are you going to travel without infrastructure? How are you going to uh, even you know, connect without infrastructure, being transport or digital, or now we're talking a lot about energy? So uh, I would very much invite uh, tourist sector to be more horizontal. I haven't heard about any emergency big meeting between health, tourism, uh, transport, economy, uh, when the COVID started. Nobody, nobody took an action and really bring an attention to the significance of the political actions that follow the COVID uh, announcements. Uh, we are in a political crisis, my dear friends. We have a climate change. That's a natural process. Yes, people have speeded up the climate change to the point that it's really hard to readjust. But that's not a crisis. That's a long-lasting 60,000 years process. We're talking about energy. We're not in energy crisis. There is enough energy everywhere. We are in a political energy crisis because there's a lot of... There's been a lot of intermediates who are making huge money with this political situation. But we are actually in a crisis of vision, in a crisis what to do with this planet. And our Western civilization is stuck with some old paradigms who we try to defend instead of reinvent ourselves and be a contributing a factor to the development of the planet as a whole. Where is the vision that the tourism can follow? Where is the something that will unite us and bring us together at tables and discuss really what we want to do with humanity on this planet? Because we're becoming a pretty significant destructive force. So what has to do with the transport? A lot. Because the crisis that politicians created and used transport as a tool to impose fear and manipulation was in unbelievable. Aviation, we have a single European skies. We have all contracts that we signed, all member states, we work together. We have systems that support a single aviation market. It completely failed from one hour to another. After midnight, we forgot about that. Where were you as stakeholders? of single European skies in order to defeat something we've been fighting for for the last 30 years. It just went down the drain in about, in, with one statement. You know, fragmented approach to crisis, whatever we name it, crisis means opportunity, right? Uh, in Chinese character. Um, this is the time when we see the collective working. This is the time to use the tools that we created in order to address in a robust way the challenges that we're facing. And I haven't seen any of that. So it's my clear invitation that we actually work much better as an ecosystem, that we understand these horizontal structures, and that tourism becomes one of the key strategic horizontal components that can bring these things together, health, transport, energy, Digital, you know, we're going to see more and more cyber tourism. I haven't heard a word about it. 
a little bit about reading instead of visiting. But the cyber tourism is getting bigger and bigger because of these special new conditions that a health crisis uh, created. We saw, especially in Asia, where you saw the biggest drop in tourism, we saw an incredible increase in digital mm. cyber tourism. It's fascinating. So if we want to really drive a change, we really have to be present uh, with the sincere needs that people are, uh, are, are uh, ready to pay for, if you address them, but uh, and transport will, pl will also play an important role, let's say regionally. Let me go back, but I had to put a bigger picture in order to make a point. Regionally, it was typical in Europe, all of a sudden, railways, road transport started to play a huge role. And all of a sudden, countries are waking up to something that the EU was trying to do for the last, since the beginning. Single European transport area. Connect countries with high-speed trains, with night trains. It was a joke. We couldn't get politicians on board on the local levels to really support something like that. And now all of a sudden you want to get it overnight. It takes 30 years to develop projects like that. Mm -hmm. It cannot happen overnight. So can we think strategically? And aviation-wise, aviation is the only currently connecting point for global tourism. And if we don't work together on the level of UN, and that's why we have ICAO, we have a UN chapter that deals with global aviation mm -hmm. issues, and we haven't used it. So yes, transport has to be present at every single discussion that tourism has in order for you to be resilient and to be really ready for all the changes we're today discussing. And here it is in, in your person, but, but uh, one more question to you. Because we, we also look for a solution, you said that it's actually, it was a political crisis. It still is. It is. Yeah. Uh, we are a funny country uh, of, let's say, uh, it's called a speed democracy. You know, it, it occurred in Slovenia, I think, four times in the in, in last two decades that uh, a political party won the election by a landslide, which was actually formed um, a couple of months before the election. Uh, so if, if the politics is a problem on a global level, would that, would that Slovenian way be a, a solution? I mean, how, how can we change politicians on, on the global level? No, you don't rate? change them. You change the awareness because what okay. you're aware you can address. So the, we need to become aware that no single vertical uh, player can m find a solution to complex challenges. Mm -hmm. And we are facing, and we're going to be facing for the next uh, probably couple of hundreds years, a serious challenges because the whole mm -hmm. new uh, wave of uh, changes is happening to the relationship of the planet Earth. So yes, we need to bring on board ecosystem logic, horizontal logic, to collectively decide on things, not singular and then fight. Competition models are gone. We, there, are, there is a time for collaborative models, for participatory modeling, to be really present at the decision-making uh, process. And then, it's, then you can find the solutions that people will go with. What did we see in this so-called crisis that we've been faced in the last couple of years? We see a complete mistrust in people. How are you going to then count on customers to trust you if overall political atmosphere is don't trust people, they have no clue, we will decide about everything. Trust people that they will act responsibly, give them a chance, and then the same applies to tourism. And okay. I see this big change happening in all sectors, so it's not a criticism, it's an invitation. Invitation to really keep walking this path and to create collaborative modeling, decide uh, on a basis of participatory uh, decision-making processes. And then you will see, we will transform together. We will see the change that we, mm. that we are dreaming about. Yeah? Because that's the only way to do it. No Wa single walking, entity can do it on its walking own. Walking is a great word because it's also a means <laughs> of transport and it's very ecologic, so yes walk the same way. Well, uh, we also search, and that's our second topic, uh, well, how, how to overcome uh, the crisis, which is here, so it's, it's the climate crisis, and of course the, the current problems with, with energy, which will probably uh, uh, be unfortunately uh, more present in, in, the, in, in the years to come. So, so how do you see the solutions from, from your 
organization's point of view, Mr. Dresa? What, what, what can you, what can we do in order, um, in order to overcome uh, the, the crisis w which are here and uh, will be even bigger uh, in the time to come? There, there, as uh, Luis explained, there are crises on which you have an impact or you can manage and others on which you have little to say and little influence. Um, the uh, energy crisis, be it a political one or a real one, and actually for companies it is a real one. For an hotel, uh, the bill at the end of the mm. month or of the year is, um, is uh, changing dramatically. Um, it, it's something we can't we can manage. So we need to, let's say, um, choose our battle. And um, I think that the industry, as, um, as Terry and uh, Alessandra said uh, earlier, um, don't talk about uh, recovery, but we need to, to make the change. And um, the, the target for the industry is to um, um, put sustainability at the um, mm -hmm. top priority, if I may say. What is um, the positive surprise is that um, the industry um, as a whole, but also our travel agents and, and tour operators um, have embraced this, uh, this issue uh, right after COVID. We could have think that or thought that uh, they would first focus on managing the, you know, you know surviving, which mm -hmm. was a, a priority, but um, they, they want to change things. Uh, we are partners of a European project, so even if the Commission is not always very, very active, they still do uh, positive things. And we have 600, 600 companies in Europe who uh, decided to invest time, energy to put sustainability in, the, in their business model uh, today, not mm -hmm. in the next year, and to do it practically, so getting training, coaches, certification. Mm -hmm. So um, the industry needs to choose battle, uh, and uh, I think the one we need to work on immediately is sustainability. Um, the other one on which we have little impact, but is very important, is the digital revolution and uh, all the uh, perspective you, you mentioned. Uh, but I think it's also one of the aspects we'll discuss later. Yes, but, of course, we're but, discussing but this right is, now, yeah. Uh, this is really essential for industry, even if we know that travel has been one of the first hit by the uh, digital revolution. Um, you know, we all went to a travel agent and tour operator yeah. in 90 to, to book a travel to the You Do It Online. It's still a travel agent, but it's an online travel agent. But let's come back mm -hmm. on, on Yeah. That uh, uh, how will uh, Mr. Dale, uh, the President Biden's Inflation Reduction Act, which is, let's say, a sort of a US version of, of a green and digital uh, um, agenda the European Commission has, has set uh, last year, how, how will that actually impact uh, your, your business? Well, our politicians have a unique way of packaging something around what really, it's not going to directly impact inflation. So, so that's, that's, what, we learned, that's, that's a, what we learned from the Americans, actually, because yes. it's the same in Europe. We yeah. have packages okay. of all kinds. Okay, so we're in the same bucket when yeah. it comes to that. There are good things. Uh, within the Inflation Reduction Act that was passed. And obviously around climate, mm -hmm. uh, those are all very uh, positive things. Um, I don't, you know, I just have to say, I am so enamored with our panel here because in my mind, there are so many things going, setting aside your question as our beloved moderator. Um, we are celebrating our 50th anniversary this year at USTOA. And on the plane ride over yesterday, um, and I tend to do my best thinking when I'm on a plane. I don't know why, but I do. And what I wrote down was um, searching for vision. And my, my colleague here nailed it when regrettably, the vision, certainly, that we have lacking in the US, and I won't try and say whether it's here or other parts of the world, but it's the vision that is lacking. And we, as an industry, have to step up and create and execute and imagine the vision that we need for a sustainable future of travel. Mm -hmm. So um, 
I'm working on that. I don't have the answer. We did our first sustainability summit in Norway uh, two months ago, where we spent three days uh, with key stakeholders uh, around that topic. But vision is key. And we need a vehicle that we all coalesce around to execute and believe in that vision. But it's not easy. It's not easy. But yeah. we shouldn't be intimidated. Mr. Trezor has a vision. No, 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 oh, no, 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 no. I, I, fully, I fully agree. I, but sometimes we need to wait for the vision. And this is not good. We don't have the time. Yeah. So I think what is very positive is that you see a lot of initiatives, either in the destinations, here in Slovenia, Slovenia, <laughs> um, in, in travel agents, uh, airlines, uh, airport, name it. Um, we need to help them put that into practice and, and, and work on that and develop these initiatives. And it will help maybe to have a vision more quickly. Because if we wait for this vision, um, I won't say it will be too long or uh, too, too, too late, but I mean, we miss some opportunities. Just a really quick comment. Yeah. Um, Please agree with polit me. <laughs> yeah. ah, I definitely agree with you that we need that. But look, politicians are offering us transhumanization. Do you want to support that? Do you want to support the down of Western civilization? Or you want to support maybe as what I called eco-civilization, something that will bring people and the planet together again from all over the world. Uh, it is out there in the air. Just grab it and decide. I mean, which way do you want to go? I certainly are not in favor of transhumanism. And I will encourage you to think in that direction too. And then let's join forces, because there is in the air it's offering itself. Let, let us hear Mr. Frangesh, because some say in Slovenia at least, that, well, politicians have vision, but only for the four years of the term. Uh, so, so, I mean, uh, uh, or even less, or even less. Uh, but but uh, how would you be able to grab this vision uh, as a politician? Uh, and when, because it's, it's... Well, we are talking today about glo uh, global tourism. And but I'm we're not, talking also I'm about Slovenian tourism. I'm not that certain uh, that, I can, uh, that I am able to deliver the global vision. But what I am certain about is the Slovenian tourism industry has its own vision. It could be put like it says in the strategy. A bit more, but much, much better. You came to Blit. Please visit us more often because we need you as tour operators to travel the best possible guests to discover Slovenia. And it's not only Bled, it's also Ljubljana, the coast, the Prekmurje, the all the possible uh, experiences you can uh, enjoy in Slovenia. I'm in my seat for three months now and I'm sorry that maybe I still look at the tourism as a tourist. And you know what is the most precious thing, and it's a wisdom from my wife, actually. Why Why are you pointing at me? I'm not your wife. <laughs> <laughs> Why it is important to travel, to spend every weekend uh, going somewhere. You know why? Because this is the best possible way to create memories for my family, for my children, about their happy childhood that will reflect the better future mm -hmm. for us all. But, okay, to be concreter. Uh, what was already said in the presentations, I believe that this is uh, quite a good roadmap. What we need, what, what we face in the Slovenian industry, let's say. Okay, first of all, and it's a global phenomenon, the lack of people. Why we came here? Because we didn't cherish them enough. Because we didn't pay uh, cooks, waiters, cleaners enough that we show not only that they deserve a better pay, but they deserve human dignity, Mr. Aujo was talking about. That was a structural problem in the industry. I'm very happy to see today the section of hospitality, of our entrepreneur uh, uh, trade union, as well as uh, people from our tourism and hospitality trade union, 
and I'm pretty sure that, he, uh, he, uh, sorry, chambers, that people from the trade union are also here. In September, you are stepping into an enormously important process, discussing what, how, what can we do to pay people more, to show that we cherish their work because, as we said, people are the ones that bring the quality, the service, that people are tourism. More than 30 years ago, Slovenia had a promotional video called My Land. And the saying of that campaign was, tourism, we, so, we the people are the tourism. We the people is actually the, the American constitution, yeah, yeah. but uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, tur tourism is people. Okay. The connectivity, just to finish yeah. very uh, briefly, uh, we have an enormous problem in Slovenia, uh, Mrs. Bulls is full aware of that, with the connectivity with major European airport hubs. It is impossible to travel to Slovenia, and you all experienced this in, in previous days. This is a market failure, okay? And in order for us to be able to um, use business opportunities we have in this sector. We have to fill in this gap. How? With a strong intervention of the state and possibly the European Commission. Don't forget the railways. It's political failure, don't let's yeah. face it, because the planning of the transport infrastructure was well, opposing. Okay, I, I wouldn't uh, emphasize market too much and blame all on the politicians because Sorry, uh, the current uh, effects we face now are also the failure of the market. Excuse me. Why? Because our uh, power plants still produce electricity, uh, for example, a nuclear uh, power plant, Kor uh, Kershko, for 45 euros. On Drava River, there is a uh, production cost of 27 euros. On spot in France last week, the cost was 1,000 euros. And our businesses, our hotels, our spas and wellnesses are paying these prices today. What, why I am leaving early okay. is because of the Committee on Econo uh, Economic Affairs in the National Parliament discussing our law, how to help uh, the economy to uh, prevent this before the regulation we need and what our tourism as a hospitality mm -hmm. uh, chamber demands as well as other parts of uh, economy. Because this huge gap of prices in energy, somebody is putting them into, our, uh, into their pockets. And why we need strong intervention? because our small and medium and large companies demand this uh, in order to uh, survive these difficult times in the tourism uh, industry as well as uh, others. And not to mention, when we are talking about the people in the industry, uh, Maya Park is leading a splendid campaign of promotions of the, of the uh, work in this industry. It's a nice work, it's hard work. It's dealing with people, but because it's about dealing with people, it's a nice profession. And it's, it's, it's a long way to go because it's, I mean, it's, we're still uh, in the beginning, fixing, let's say, the approach, uh, fixing the connectivity when it comes to airlines. Don't, don't forget the railways, which were mainly built by the old Austrians uh, here uh, many, many years ago. So that's also one, one of the failures we, we face. So there, Slovenia is still, let's say, um, a building place. Uh, but, but Ms. Priyanti, we, we haven't heard a lot from you um, in the last, last minutes. But we, we we're now speaking about um, green uh, transition and, and digital and, of course, the visions for, for tomorrow and and after tomorrow, we'll, we'll, where, where to grab this vision? So how, how we could actually um, save the planet, the planet with the help of tourism? Tourism is a major drive for all of this, exactly for all the reasons that we pointed out here. And my answer would be um, that the UNWTO has that vision. Mm -hmm. The UNWTO is the global platform 
not only for member states, for the industry, but also for the non-members. We are the only UN agency specialized in tourism. And Violeta, I'm sorry, but I am going to, uh, I mean, when you mentioned, you know, you should talk to, we did. From the very first moment, we sat down with everyone, all our sister agencies. The Global Tourism Crisis Committee was exactly that. We sat everybody down virtually, obviously, because we had that. And we called everybody. But you know what? Everybody was very busy, correctly, with their own national problems, with the shock, with everything. So I'm going to go back to answering your question. Um, we have a politician here, once again, who's being very concrete. We have to stop thinking about the bigger picture if we're not sure that we're able to follow up once we have that vision. For me, visions are interesting, but also the way we implement this vision is far more interesting. So normally, what I do, for example, when I prepare for things and stuff, I normally prepare the structure because I know that whatever happens, I have the plan A, plan B, plan C. What I still see missing here is that we're still talking in like separate compartments, we're talking better, definitely, but we're still talking separate compartments. We might come up with a vision, but when it comes to implementing the vision, each one goes regional, local, each one has his own problems. Of course, each one has to respond to his own challenges. There's a lot of associations. Each association demands the politician something. You have the tour guys that want this. You have the tour operators that want that. You have the, the, the guys, so, and? You need to find the synthesis. Because we talk crisis, let's use another Greek word, let's talk synthesis. How do we bring this together? Now, I think there's no, obviously, there's no general official recipe. But I think we said some very important things today that we need to carry mm -hmm. forward, which is we definitely need to be far more inclusive when we want to do something. We need to talk to everyone. We wake up in the morning and we have a great idea. The probably the most difficult human thing to do is to share that idea with someone. First of all, you think, oh, he's gonna steal my idea. Second thing is, uh, no, maybe he's gonna criticize what, no. Actually, let's put things on the table and let's ask for everybody's contribution. Something good is gonna come out of it. Let's do it with generosity. Let's do it with vision. Mm -hmm. Let's do it with a plan. Every plan has time indicated, list of actions, and KPIs. We're talking about connectivity, increasing connectivity, and Melior definitely. I mean, I love coming to, to Slovenia because I drive from Italy, but because I'm Italian, so I enjoy that part of you know driving, and I encourage everyone to do that. Slow tourism, looking around, whatever. Railway is true. even better. Railway, I agree with you. I do a lot of things on the trains, but uh, riding, concentrating what you do on the plane, for example. But for example, you were mentioning, definitely, I want to come to Ljubljana more often from Madrid with the, with the flight. So that's going to be a challenge that we give you from you and WTO for you to be able to reopen that direct flight. But then my question is, how many people do you want in Slovenia? It's not about just saying, I want Slovenia to be hyper-connected. Because then there's going to be a moment where you're going to have lots of people and, and, and your Slovenian people are going to say, that's too much. What is this? It's completely disorganized. So we have to change. It's a long way. Yes. Yeah. That's why you have, you're very lucky because you are in a, in a country where you have a structure that is going to do you that planning. So you have to understand as a destination, you are the example. Each destination has to understand, evaluate, plan, and say, I am actually, I want to, these are my priorities. Mountains, rural tourism, and the lakes. The rest, I'm going to put a little bit on the side. Then, this, uh, how many people can I handle considering all the costs that I have? This much. And this is how you plan accordingly, and then you execute the plan, you implement it, and then two years later, you see what you're doing. Green transition. Slovenia was doing green when nobody knew what green was. I was in Slovenia, where it is. Yes. I was telling Maya yesterday, you've probably you've done it too early because you know this would have been the right time to do it because everyone would have listened to you. But you guys have the advantage that you know how to do it for real. And your people follow you. They understand what is, we tell them one plastic initiative, they understand it immediately, they jump on it. You know what I'm saying? So use that position to be in a leading, in a leading uh, role 
use the platforms, the multilateral platforms, to show your colleagues around the world how you do it, get their, hold their hands, and have designed something with them. We are not offering you the only solution, but we're offering you the platform. The UNWTO is at your disposal, and Violeta, I'm going to give you a task now. Sorry, Igor. I'm, I'm, just do it. Just do I it. told you I was going to be I'm going. ready. <laughs> you come from the European institutions. Yes. And as my colleague very generously reminded, I'm the only one coming from you know, my background who managed to bring the UNWTO into a dialogue with the European yeah. institutions. Adina Valian was the first person that I met and I sat down with her and I told her, even before tourism was being assigned, I told her, travel is tourism. Take tourism with you. I told her, do this change in the beginning. And then no, once again, it went back there. So how help us as Zuritza was mentioning before. How do we make tourism more with, with a greater dignity, more heard at a European level so that these member states don't need to struggle with regional programs, PON, PNRR, supports, whatever, at a regional level, at an association level, to get a small chunk of money? How do we make that discourse at a European level really relevant? Okay, a couple of very concrete, concrete answers. Can I just excuse no. myself, Violeta, Terry, Alessandra? Yeah, yeah uh, you, you, you heard the bell. Go, uh, we were uh, in contact with the local priest. That's the reminder that uh, he has to go. Also, uh, welcome in Slovenia. Come back. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, I'll be Mr. very Fungus. quick. A couple yeah. of very concrete projects that are going on that tourism can potentially support. First of all, single ticketing uh, and integrated ticketing. This is very much in favor of tourism. And we need to, we, you need to work together with the transport to get it done. Second one, because it's uh, obstacles they don't on the. No, don't no, they see do. Us, they do. Violeta. No, they don't. I'm telling they you, they do, don't but see it, us. It's a local challenge because local local interests are prevailing over the integrated interests. But that's where we need to work together. The second one, urban aviation space is one of huge potentials. Europe has uh, uh, already all the uh, regulation in place. It has uh, all the implementing uh, rules in place. This will be a game changer in tourism. Yeah? So you can imagine that you don't need physical infrastructure anymore in order to do uh, experiential uh, tourism. So just a thought. Work with them because in, by 2030 this will be possible. The third one is single border controls. I mean, uh, we have it with the US with couple of, in a couple of cross-border uh, points, but this has to continue. This is very important. It's a smooth travel. It brings the global international tourists uh, to the single uh, uh, destinations in a much uh, smoother way. Uh, tourism was pushed from transport uh, under uh, the European single market. So uh, that's where it is, because it is recognized as an as a economical driver. If you want to be more than an economical driver, then again, you have to fight through your local politicians, prime ministers, ministers, to give the proper uh, placement on the EU level. EU is a project, it's not a country. Let's not forget, it's a, it's a direct result of the agreements that member states, prime ministers, ministers make. And EU can do only one, what the Council and the Europe PM Parliament gives the responsibility for. So maybe you need to knock on more doors at the same time, especially on the prime minister's doors and the doors of the local ministers. Yeah, but Violeta, we need help. It's not about just, you. You're, once again, you're doing the Brussels thing, which is you drop it back on tourism. Brussels needs to understand what tourism is. Until Brussels makes that awareness move, nothing but is Brussels going to change. Brussels are member states. No, they're not, because the moment that commissioners sit and have their own structures, they completely lose that sense of, I have to report back to the member state, and they leave the member states fighting for money. I Let's talk sorry about to that later, but commission has no, um, uh, no uh, power to uh, implement uh, new changes. But you have the power to recognize it. That it is. That you have power yes. to recognize yes. it. But okay. you know who gives them the strength? Okay. <laughs> okay. Ter Terry? This? Terry, do you, do you agree, Terry, that there is love I in am, Slovenia? Th th there is definitely love. I love him very and, much. And I, I <laughs> love and I this kind of dialogue that our beloved moderator created. Because that's, that we, 
we should be able to have this Don't kind of... Don't blame me for everything. We should be able to have this conversation. So, everyone in the room, do you have too much tourism in Slovenia? Raise your hand. Yeah, in some parts, in, in the capital of Ljubljana. Okay. Our moderator and one hand went up in the back. So, this is the opportunity for you in this room today. Because different regions around the world, high, val high volume versus high value. So you're in a position to identify what's the appropriate best fit for your country as far as the visitor. And that's what you want to target. And it's not an easy exercise to go through. But I think that um, I like to say we have a responsibility. All of us in the travel industry, when it comes to sustainability, we have a responsibility in making sure that we manage, as opposed to market, what travel can do in a positive way for our local economy and our neighborhoods and the people who call this place home. So high value versus high volume, and let's approach it from a responsible perspective. That's right. it. Yeah, I can't, I can't agree more with you. Um, we, the perspective of the companies is also important. I mean, talking about infrastructure, states, and, 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 and uh, destination. But this is an industry which has been price-driven for very long, and the margin of the companies are very low. And this has a cost on the quality of the service. When we say, and it's not blaming hotels, because we as travel agents and tour operators, we have also an issue with uh, labor shortage. So we, if you don't pay for the service you get, then you can, you can pay the people decently. That's where we need to focus on the quality, so value, as you, as you mentioned, Terry, um, um, and not focus only on, on the price. And quality means certainly reducing, uh, in some places, mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the impact of, of uh, the number of tourism. Um, to some extent, um, we have seen in COVID uh, that under-tourism was a bad thing. I mean, we were talking about over-tourism in the past years, but on, under-tourism has been a new word for, for some months. Um, but it, in a way, it opened a sort of um, refreshing view on what do we need as, as a destination. Uh, Venice today, you know, there is this temptation, and um, maybe this is for good, to organize and control the number of visitants on the daily basis. Um, the decision is not yet taken, if, I am, if I'm, I'm OK. It's, 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 very, it's a dramatic change, but it's maybe a change that needs to be taken in some places. And, um, and I agree with you, uh, Terry. This is the right momentum today to think about those new ways of organizing, uh, organized tourism. Because otherwise, we'll have what we had in the French press a uh, few days ago, uh, philosophers telling that we need to ban tourism. Not Mr. Zizek. Not Mr. Zizek. <laughs> no, no, no. But so we, we go, of course, it was a bit more moderate in terms of, of content, but we, we, we have a risk. And we don't, we, we don't have to take this risk. And we need, we have the chance, and we need to, to prepare the future in that, uh, with that in mind uh, to make this business profitable for everyone. Great. Uh, let us qualify for the lunch buffet by opening uh, uh, the discussion also uh, to the audience. Uh, we have two ladies with uh, two microphones, so uh, if you would like to join uh, the conversation or with your ideas, with your vision, with your question to, to our uh, panelists, you're, you're free to do it. Uh, we have a lot of national sports, uh, but asking questions is not one of them, but, but uh, I, see, I see a hand. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is also Igor, but not Belgant, but Yudishic. It's harder to pronounce it, and I wish it would be only in three letters, but it's not. Uh, so uh, I would like to break the ice, but first of all, I will represent myself. I'm uh, coming from uh, Slovenian National Youth Hostler Organization, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I'm working in tourism for over 20 years. So uh, I would like to refer to yesterday's speech of respected President of Ukraine, 
uh, who among everything mentioned two things. First was uh, that we need to support and empower Russian, uh, ordinary Russians to step up against uh, the war. And the second was about banning the tourism visas for Russian citizens. But uh, even if it's, it might be unpopular to, uh, to uh, disagree with uh, respected president, uh, it, uh, this, all my uh, uh, professional, let's say, experiences led me to some conclusions which I would like to share with you and of course I would ask panelists to or confirm or, or to challenge them. Uh, but if we ban uh, visas for regular, ordinary uh, tourists from Russia, I believe it is direct support uh, to, uh, in economical and in political way to Russian authorities. And uh, because we are all from the tourism field, uh, it will be much easier first to understand what is the economical support for Russian authorities. We all know that tourism is the only export where VAT stays in the country. So if we'll keep Russian tourists to visit Russian places instead of coming to Blit, they will not eat Slovenian bread with Slovenian butter, with Slovenian cheese and ham, and use the Slovenian uh, uh, transport, but rather they will use the Russian one. So the VAT, among all others, uh, uh, VAT would not be possible to spend, for example, for helping people in the energy crisis or to support refugees for Ukraine, but could be spent, for example, uh, for, example for weapons and for munitions to uh, continue the war in Ukraine. So uh, I think if we understand that it could uh, lead to, poli uh, to financial support, I also see there is a mm -hmm. big political support to Russian authorities. Why? Because uh, if we speak, uh, if, if we want to listen to uh, President Zelensky and, uh, and follow his wish that we empower Russian people to, uh, to speak against the war, uh, first of all, we must reach them. And if we all know that the European Union banned almost all Russian information in Europe. And trust me, Russia is not more democratic than the European Union, and they did the same with information from our side. So uh, ordinary Russian citizens are not able to receive our news. And I think that tourism is the only and the best way to, uh, to g g get them informed. And when they come back to Russia, they could discuss about it openly and bring another view. Mm -hmm. So, okay. uh, in my way, we should. Uh, uh, this uh, this sanction is, of course, helping r the Russian economy and and destroying our economy. And uh, there, uh, and I, I come to the question and basically the request. So, uh, if the panelists are uh, are willing to to discuss about it and uh, maybe to support this uh, these conclusions or to see the other way and say that that I'm wrong, what I would also accept. Let's not, Thank not you very much. Night, not 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 about right and wrong, it's what, what, what we think, how we comment, any comments in, in the panel, Ms. Brianta, any? Oh. I'm not ready with a comment. <clears throat> I cannot refrain but, uh, but uh, thanking you for giving this uh, peace of mind. We have been challenged uh, about a few days ago as a UNWTO <clears throat> on how to respond to this request for the elimination of uh, visa for a tourism purpose in traveling and we are at the moment so the which is not a diplomatic answer but it's true we are consulting uh, at the at the UN level because obviously being a UN agency we cannot mm -hmm. as well we're not responsible for visa and stuff we can just do uh, whether communication or advocacy or you know that type of so we are shaping our position uh, but uh, I am personally very grateful for, um, for your point of view, to which I personally, it's a very personal position, fully agree. Because it's, we, we need to take uh, in many things into consideration. And the unfortunate thing, I said before, tourism is the industry of people. And I think that in a way we should be able to preserve tourism from uh, potential excessive politicization, but I do not have neither the tools nor the, uh, let's say, you know, technical knowledge to be able to address such an important question directly. I think your question, it's is a very, you know, decent question that many people are probably asking themselves and they're not saying as much as, when in the beginning we as UNWTO took, uh, listened 
as the only UN agency to the requests of many member states, including, including Ukraine, and we called upon uh, uh, an extraordinary executive council, which then called upon an extraordinary general assembly. We were the only UN agency who actually suspended the membership of the Russian Federation. Yes, on the same day, they then withdrew because, of course, they needed to take the scene. So it was very important for them to do that. Um, but uh, this is to tell you how much we took that seriously and how much we are at the moment supporting the uh, Ukrainian uh, sort of tourism structure to, to remain alive and to stay uh, steady because it's incredibly difficult for them at this moment. Um, but I remember at the time when we started, I personally had many member states that confidentially told me, we're not very happy with this because Russia is and was a big, big source of, uh, of uh, income in terms of the number of tourists, mm -hmm. one of them being Italy. Yeah? Okay, Mr. Dessa. Um, obviously, this is not a position of our organization on this, on this matter because we, we did not debate, and I think it's not the role of a, of a non-profit organization to have such a political statement. Um, I would say I'll, I'll, I agree with uh, Alessandra and uh, with your position, with your comments, uh, for three reasons. First, um, invading Ukraine was not a decision of the, of the population. It was the decision of a um, yeah, the head of state. Uh, I don't say that they are not supporting it, but at least it's not their primary choice. Um, so, Mr. of Mrs. X, Y, Z, uh, maybe don't have to suffer um, um, exaggerately about, uh, from this decision. Second, um, Russians are traveling. They are in Turkey, they are in other destinations than Europe. So, um, if there is a ban, um, they will go somewhere else. Um, third, Let's think about what travel is about and tourism. We mentioned very um, rapidly about the image, about um, changing, but when you travel, you meet people, you meet another culture, there is an exchange. And if you block people, if you force them to stay in their own country, they just hear the same noise, the same music, and um, and also, maybe it's interesting for us to listen to what they have to say as, uh, as citizens. So um, I would say, um, beyond the economic impact, which I fully agree, there is this um, ethical, political dimension that we need to, um, to keep in mind. But this is a very personal view. So I would just say, for 50 years, we have been all about open borders. That any US traveler should be able to go to any country that he or she chooses to experience. And I feel the same uh, for your Russian citizens. Um, this would not be something that we would support. Mm -hmm. um, travel is a bridge, and we need to celebrate that. Yep. Maybe just one uh, quick comment to all this. Um, I think we need to be aware that uh, what is happening right now, and we think that the whole world is in this framework of uh, political constellation, we need to be aware that it's only one third of the world in that. The two thirds of the world, as colleague mentioned, is not affected by the Ukraine crisis. So uh, here no, we would- Not yet. Not yet. Here we would need much, by far more uh, political strength, and maybe it's an opportunity to uh, discuss how to act in the cases like this whenever the war zone uh, reappears in whichever part of the world. This is something that maybe UN could have a discussion on. And I invite my colleague that maybe tourism can be the one who can foster this kind of discussion. Um, and uh, so this perspective is very valid. And what you mm -hmm. all said, uh, uh, it's a very valid comment. Uh, so the one that really suffers right now in this situation is Euro. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, because his name was Igor and so is mine, you may know that the name Igor actually comes from Kiev and surroundings. Uh, uh, the Ukrainian version is Ihor, 
but it's actually no no it's it's true and it was actually uh, but it it came from Sweden with the Vikings uh, who traveled from Sweden to 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 and and, and formed then a state around Kiev uh, that was in the ninth or tenth century so it was actually it's a name which came with tourists uh, the the original ver <laughs> Only our, only our beloved moderator could make that bridge. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Perfect. The, the original name was Ingvar. So, yeah. Uh, so. And the other one was Oleg, which, which is also Ukrainian or in Russian name. And it comes from Ule. So, uh, okay. The two names from tourists. Uh, any other question? Any other hand? I Igor, I'm sorry, can I ask the person, the only hand that I saw regarding uh, uh, not happy about having many tourists to, to make Had a enough. comment? Okay, yeah. Had yeah, enough. Yeah. yeah. That is bold. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, the, the gentleman. I don't yeah. know what her, what it, what's her name? Igor. Uh, my name is Stanislav Raschan. Uh, I'm from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Slovenia. Uh, former deputy minister, and in two days I will be Slovenian ambassador to Bratislava. Uh, so, uh, seeing you know so many tourists in, of course, downtowns of uh, Bratislava, where is located my embassy, our Slovenian embassy, and also so many tourists uh, in downtown Ljubljana, uh, uh, in in the peak of the season, and. Uh, Coming recently from uh, Ohrid Lake, uh, just yesterday, I was uh, in, in Ohrid in northern Macedonia, where now in the peak of the season, there are also uh, many, many tourists. Uh, I would say that, uh, 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 and this was my first reaction, that, uh, yeah, in this uh, uh, Lake Bled, Lake Ohrid, uh, uh, capitals, and so on, uh, maybe there are too many tourists already and we need to bring them uh, also to uh, other parts of Slovenia, like to my home, Prekmore. Thank you so much. <laughs> which is really a nice region. That's actually the only part of Slovenia which doesn't have high mountains. And so it's, it's, really, it's really unique. Uh, so thank you very much, Mr. Rashtan. Yes, we have another question by the Igor, lady here. I'm so sorry. Can yeah. I quickly react? Oh, yes, of course. Yeah. Sorry. No, because he was my choice. So yeah, like... yeah. <laughs> sorry. Well, first of all, I don't know, Luis, something, you know, and everything happens for a purpose. This is one of our challenges. This is one of our challenges. He's a diplomat. He's gonna represent Slovenia and Bratislava, and this is the way he's thinking. And Luis just was telling us yesterday, he had a similar experience with a high level official from Brussels, who thinks exactly the same about Portugal, too many tourists in Portugal. Now this, and he is speaking from the perspective of the tourist, but he's gonna keep this in mind. So this is a challenge because we have to understand one thing. We're all humans. We are, I agree with you, we're very destructive and definitely something needs to change. But what happened with pandemic? We, we were brought into a situation of complete halt and complete halt uh, besides the, obviously the, the reasons and the sickness, which is very sad and difficult for many, many of us brings us to a total change in the way we feel, we think, we mm. eat, we sleep. Once we touch upon that well-being, we are like, okay, I want this for the rest of my, of my life. And we immediately forgot because the, how many people did you talk to that says, ah, you know, I went to, I don't know, I'm gonna mention my country just because it's very touristic, but you know, I went to Roma, so beautiful, I was going around the Colosseum, was empty, amazing. When that thing becomes a value, and I think that obviously when you see it surrounded by people, you're gonna stand in a queue, it's hot, and you take, even though you have your ticket, your water and everything, obviously you're gonna feel disturbed. So we're gonna, the challenge is now is, is precisely, we have to tackle the human side mm -hmm. by being very inclusive in the way not only we communicate, but we make people re-enjoy the feeling that we're talking about, meeting people, being with people, the Madeira feeling. Luis, we were almost there, you know, when 
ah, people with suitcases, oh, can I help you and stuff. No, we have to get that back. And that's where we're going to be one of the biggest challenges that we have because we don't know how we evolved because we were all isolated and we were not communicating. Mm. So first thing we need to do is get back into that state of mind of that vision, you know? I think that is an, an area where I would yeah. want to place the vision. And sorry, just to get back no, to that, no. but because we ha somehow need to be concrete because sooner or later, all these stakeholders are gonna have to face the groups of citizens who are gonna put things on their balconies saying no more trolleys or no more tourists. So that's it. Thank you very much, by the way, and good luck. Congratulations on your mission. Okay, thank you. Um, I think um, what's uh, Stanislas? Yeah, so. Stanislaw. Stanislaw. Stan. Stanislav. Uh, Stanislav. Stan. Um, mention is one aspect of what we raised with the sustainability. Uh, destination management, management of flow is essential. Um, and uh, when we're, sustainability is not about putting, it's not only about uh, putting solar panel on the roof of the, uh, of the hotels, but also help people to go um, at another time yeah at another place and try to discover uh, a destination in a, in a different way. Um, and this is, uh, this is very important. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you may say, I, I'm, I will advocate for my own industry, but going with a tour operator help, and for Terry, mm -hmm. help also to organize the flow of tourists because they know when people are going to certain destination, they know the capacity of the de destination. They organize with the destination some activities and they can help destination to have a year-round activity, for instance, uh, and design the proper, um, the proper offer for their, their customers. Of course, you can do it on your own, um, and we all do it when we travel to the next country, but um, there's an added value also with working with travel advisors and, and look at tourism in another perspective just as consumption. And that's, that's the image that we need to bring back in, in, in the society. Tourism is important for the business uh, of, of the economy, but it's also quality, uh, or what we said uh, just before, quality and, and um, meeting people and uh, sharing. I have one. Uh, sharing. I think mm -hmm. sharing is a key. Great. Before we go to the last question, uh, I have one. Uh, for a Slovenian ambassador in Slovakia, 24, 25 years ago, it would be a challenge to say, well, I'm the Slovenian ambassador to Slovakia, and people in Europe and the States would say, well, Slovenia, Slovakia, it's the same. How, how come? I mean, now it's different because people really know Slovenia and Slovakia, and they know that two different countries, they... They know that they have both uh, really fantastic tourism and, and so on. And we even beat Slovakia in ice hockey, which was, in, uh, which was not, not imaginable some, some years ago. So it's okay. And I think that Mr. Rashan comes from Prikmurje. There is a, a nice tower and you can, in good days, you can see Slovakia from, from the Vinarium Tower. Although we don't share a border. So, it's, so visit, visit Prikmurje. Uh, l last question from the lady, if she didn't give up, uh, no, she, so. Yeah. It works? Yeah. I'm just going to step here that you can all see me. I'm um, from Association of Slovenian Tourist Guides. My name is Tina Hrast and uh, this is the oldest association in Slovenia. It will uh, be 35 years old next year which is quite an accomplishment. The organization. Yes, yeah, the organization. Uh, yeah. I'm a little bit older, older than 35. <laughs> but anyway, uh, yeah, I also uh, have an incoming, incoming uh, tourist agency. And uh, it was interesting uh, to listening to all of you. Uh, I'm actually very grateful that we have also female representatives here, very passionate ones. And I so agree with you, what you started with when you said that uh, we should listen each other and we should communicate and um, that's uh, but before I address this I want to say something about tourism okay so I'm, I'm all about organized tourism because it all comes back to locals the insights that we know so it would be so much better for tourism in general if everyone would travel in organized way 
what you were talking about. So operators, tourist agencies, locals. We know what is best and we would know how to advise to our guests uh, that are actually future travelers to our country where to go, what is the best, what to expect, and they would come with better expectations, you know, because expectations are the key, how to make your guests happy or unhappy. They come with certain expectations and uh, you have to meet these expectations. So I have been working as a travel director or tour manager, if you prefer, for 17 years. So I know a little bit something about guests and how they behave. And you all have to make them ha happy at the end of the day, right? So imagine that you have 40 people sitting in, in, an, in a coach and now uh, this is organized, right? Uh, we do things together. I tell them where we go together. Then they do have free time, of course. This is not like military situation. It's still, you know, free world, hopefully, for a long time. And, you know, when it comes to luggage service, we do it organized. You know, it's not traffic jam in the, in the elevator. We do everything, you know, by the insights and by the knowledge of us, tourist experts. So now put these 40 passengers from a coach in individual cars or even worse, this... Uh, vans they're traveling around and then we do then we see the images that we see you know on our national tv which you're representing mr igor uh traffic jams at Vršić mountain pass and so on and people complaining about it because it was not organized that's why we need organized tourism that's how that's when we step in you and i and i'm in interaction with guests and now back to communication we still hope and we really hope that we will be, you know, sitting at the same table with Association of Slovenian Tourist Agencies, which Mr. Knaus is representing here. As I said, I'm from Slovenian Association of Tourist Guides. We're so important. And a lot of you know this here. We are this interaction. We are this direct interaction with guests. And we know what is going on on the road. We can hear, you know, the complaints or good things, you know, about, I don't know, certain restaurant, certain service and so on. So please, Maya Pak. Next time when we send you a letter, do hear us out. That's why we're here. We want to do things better for this country and Europe in general. Thank you so much. Okay. Ted was bold. <laughs> and I like the surname. Hrast means oak. That's the, um, that's the national tree of Styria, which is a neighboring region to Prikmurje, where Mr. Roschan comes from. So... Hrast Oak. Well, any comment on that? Uh, no? Uh, you can surely discuss it with Ms. Pak, uh, Ms. Hrast, uh, afterwards at lunch, because we have finally qualified for the lunch buffet due to a lively discussion and bold statements by the panelists. Thank you very much. Another applause. And of course, we, we had some interaction and uh, we even had uh, questions from the audience, which is also great, unique three questions in 10 minutes. It's a, a sort of a Slovenian record. Uh, you so know what, I, ju I just have yeah. to follow up on <laughs> what our friend, colleague here said. Mrs. First of all, you're ambassadors for all of us and you are key, we know that. But there's, I don't know if you're familiar with Saturday Night Live, but in New York City, in the States, SNL, Saturday Night Live, they did a skit about one of my members, Perillo Tours, who's iconic in Italy. And basically, Adam Sandler said, if you're unhappy before you come on our tour, you're gonna be unhappy when you leave our tour. <laughs> and you know what? You have the best intentions, and you do everything you can, and, and we appreciate that, so. <laughs> Thank you very much. We know that Americans always love to have the last word, which is okay. <laughs> so. I just say, God bless us all and especially America. So thank you very much and enjoy the lunch at the terrace. Bye. <laughs> okay.